Good morning and welcome again to the second of Kirk and Andy's Hacking Hours. Again, blatantly ripping off Hamish and Andy's happy hours. Uh, so, we've had a session already this morning. Um, thank you very much for coming back, if you've come back. Or, uh, so very sorry if you're coming here for the first time. Um, hopefully it's not too bad. So, uh, Adventurous, who wasn't here uh, at the previous one and therefore doesn't know who we are? So, the uh, hello for those who weren't here before. I apologise for those who were here before. Uh, so this is uh, Mr. Kirk Jackson. He is the security uh, officer for Xero. Yep. Uh, which is the uh, world's easiest to use online accounting system. Okay. Yes. And this is Mr. Andy Prow, um, who is a manager. And oh, <laughs> oh, that's almost code, but he's a wanker. <laughs> Dude. Um, who's the managing director and founder of Aura Information Security, which is a mighty fine company, and I've actually worked there for a little while. Yes, you um, We've been doing these um, security talks at Tech Ed New Zealand for the last four, four years. Or five years or something. Um, very excited to come to a sunny destination to give talks. Um, at the moment, the weather is pretty crap back home. It's terrible back home. It's about yeah. minus four. Yep. At our place in Wellington. Um, and but it, so um so the dedication of, of coming here though. So um, I missed out last night. So um, uh, as a little plug, Aura actually won the Auckland Business Excellence Awards last night. I know. Thank you. <laughs> So the rest of the team had a lovely dinner and they got drunk on lots of wine and celebrated while I was here with Kirk working on the Prezzo. Yeah. I know, I know. That's they, dedication. That's they dedication. don't even know what Auckland is. Um, it's a good point. So it's picture a, point. a suburb of Sydney. And take about <laughs> half of the houses and we call that busy. Yeah. So... So what we're going to do, so look, um, so our, our mission in the world is that we are um, improving people's understanding of uh, web security issues. Uh, in fact, just security issues full stop. It's not just web, but this is a web-related session. So what we're going to do Get is... Get a web spidey sense. <laughs> you would have laughed oh. when you got home. <laughs> you can tell it's an Aussie audience. They're like, oh, <laughs> jeez. Pretty smart. Um, so... Um, so what we thought we'd do today, rather than showing you hacks, which is kind of what we did in the first talk, um, is we wanted to kind of get you in the mindset of just watching out for those weird things that are happening around you. So as developers, we see a lot of stuff going on in our company. You know, we get to log into the HR system, we get to, um, you know, get paid or whatever we do in HR systems. Um, we see other teams building stuff. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of a, a tingle a little bit of a spidey sense in the back of your head to think something's not quite right with that. Um, so what we've put together is, um, is a little takeaway thing. So um, they'll be up here at the end. It's just a list of different spidey senses. Um, about half of you will be able to take one of these home and the rest, <laughs> the rest of you will have to, um, have to print it out yourself. So sorry about that. Um, so another thing that we find hard when we're doing talks is finding companies that actually want to talk about us to talk about their security issues. So Strangely enough. <laughs> in the previous talk, we mentioned a few um, incidents in Australia that have made the news and, and from around the world. Um, but more often than not, Andy's customers don't want us to talk about their security issues. Um, so we've, done, we've got a case study with a company called Educa. Um, it's a um, child care management system um, based in New Zealand um, where we've done a bit of a security review and helped them out a bit. Um, hey, you don't have the right font. Um, anyway, that's not important. Um, and, um, and it's pretty similar to the kind of applications that you'll be building in your organization. So it's, a, it's an ASP.NET MVC app. It's built in C Sharp. It's running on iOS 7, uses SQL Server, um, and it's got mobile apps. And while we're not going to point out bad things with this application because they've, they've had their security review done and it's all awesome, we will point out the kind of decisions that they've made along the way to sort of deal with potential security yep, issues. absolutely, absolutely. So I guess, so coming down to then, um, the theme of the spidey senses. What do we mean by the spidey senses? So from experience looking at um, websites that are broken and busted out in the wild, what we tend to find is you have the really securely developed ones that appear to have been done properly, um, people have gone through the little checklist and said, yes, I've put all the security things I should have done. Or you have the other end of the spectrum where 
most things are broken. And I guess what we're trying to do is, so when you are using a site, when you are reviewing a site, when you're writing your code, what are those spidey senses that should trigger? And what are we talking about by a spidey sense? It's a vague but strong sense that something is wrong, dangerous, or suspicious. Picture a little Lego superhero with a large head um, swinging through the streets of, what city are we in? Surfers Paradise. Surfers. Oh, Surfers. Broad Beach. Sw through swinging the... through Broad Beach, and just out of the corner of his eye, he notices something a little bit weird and thinks, I better investigate. Absolutely. Civilians might need my help. And I guess, so when we go through this idea <laughs> of a spidey sense, when you're looking at security of a site, should trigger immediately. Something, it should suggest you there's something to have a look at. And uh, in our experience, hackers have a good spidey sense. They will tend to hone out the broken things that are in an app very well. And if you have some smart users, they will also have a good spidey sense, and they'll be the ones that will run away very quickly and not use your systems. So as part of my job at um, Zero, what I have to do is review third-party software that we're looking to adopt. Um, and so often, I look at it from a security point of view, often you can tell pretty fast whether an app has even considered security in its development or not. Um, so what we've kind of developed is a bunch of different bad smells that um, hopefully will give you an inkling that things aren't quite right in the applications that you're looking at or working on. And then we've <laughs> categorized them into kind of meta things. Absolutely. So what <laughs> we were trying for is that, uh, so OWASP, and so uh, for those people who be, be, uh, for the last one, you might know that OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project, OWASP.org. Uh, they have the OWASP Top 10. So we were trying to find a way in which we could have the uh, Kirk and Andy Top 7. Uh, and so instead of stuff like uh, broken authentication, we thought we'd go for fishy and vomit and garbage because it's more fun. Yeah. So, um, so we've categorised all these smelly things together into little, um, into little sections. Um, so the, rather than telling you here's how you build stuff, it's more about here's how you notice something might not be built properly. So the first category of, of smells are the unlocked vault. So picture the Spider-Man swinging his way through the city. So I have to play Spidey in this one? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't have a Spidey suit. But underneath? I'm not going to go underneath this. <laughs> so, um... Um, so he's swinging his way through the city and out of the corner of his eyes he sees a glint. He can see the gold sitting in the vault at the back of the casino. I don't know if they have gold at this casino um, over here. but um, Or there's something in the vault and he can smell it out of the vault. The smell of money or the smell of fish. So I guess, so what we're talking about here, this is the sense that you go to a site, you start to use it, and it appears that there are some basic security steps missing. So this often triggers very, very quickly. So... In the, um, so some of the last demos that we're running, so um, we showed some examples of sites that maybe mix HTTP, HTTP and HTTPS. Um, and so we were showing in a demo what happens there. Um, so you might get stuff like your session or auth tokens traveling around in the wild or some other data as well. Yeah, so if you see a site where you log in on HTTPS but the rest of the time you use the site, you're on HTTP um, and it still works, it still shows you logged in, that's normally a sign that... Um, your cookies are going over HTTP, which means in a Wi-Fi environment or an untrusted network, other people could steal those cookies. Um, and high-profile people that have happened to that this have happened to include such people as Steve Jobs. I mean Ashton Kutcher, um, who was at TED Talks and his Twitter cookies got stolen, and people started tweeting for him. Um, so you know you don't want that sort of thing that happened to Kelso to happen to you. Um, another example of a bad smell that's something that smells fishy is when you go to create your password or when you go to enter your password and it won't let you enter a long password. So if a site won't let you enter a password that's longer than 10 characters, that's a bit suspicious. Like, why, why won't they? Because they shouldn't be storing the whole password in the database. They shouldn't have a restriction of, you know, varchar 10 to store the password in, in your database. They should just be storing a hash. And the hash is a fixed length, so it doesn't matter how long your password is, the hash is always going to be the same size. Absolutely. So, so a SHA-1 hash will always be 40 characters. Is it? Uh, yeah, well, it's 160-bit, which is 20 bytes, which if you turn it into hex is okay. 40 characters. So there'll always be a consistent size. Um, so, and the other thing you see sometimes is l like limiting the types of characters you can use in your password. So sometimes they'll encourage you to use stronger passwords. You know, you must use a number. That's fine. But when they say you can't use a single quote in your password, that's normally a sign that their system can't handle single quotes in it. Um, so 
you need to drill deeper into that one. So I guess, um, so obviously there's good practices of the things that you keep in your um, robots TXC to tell the robots where they should stay away from. So um, it might say, don't go to slash admin, don't go to uh, slash generated invoices, uh, or something along those lines. Uh, but then what you also have is a bunch of bots out there um, that search for the robots TXT and look for the places that they're not supposed to go just so that they can go there. Um, <laughs> that's quite true, they really are. So, um, so from that side, so again, uh, it's good to try and restrict the search engines. You don't want your secret data appearing in the Google search. However, you shouldn't rely on something like that to say that's the only thing that's going to stop. Yeah, another one that we've seen sometimes is people that just unzip a zip file into their website um, directory on the server, um, including the Git hidden direct or the Git directory or the SVN directories. Um, and there's actually tools that'll enumerate that directory. So you know, like www.kirk.com slash dot SVN slash blah, and can build up the complete history of your source code and all the changes that you've checked in. Um, so make sure you don't put your source code, source control system metadata up on your websites. Um, another example of something that smells bad is when the site doesn't use the basic security headers um, that browsers now support. Um, so for the last few years, you've been able to use um, X frame options header. Um, the web server sends it to the browser, tells the browser never put this site in an iframe. Um, there's a strict transport security header, which means um, only ever access the site over SSL. Uh, there's the, uh, the no MIME type. Yep. One. So if HTTP the, only for your, your session cookie so that you can't access it through cross-site scripting. So if the site's not setting those headers, it probably means that they don't know what they mean. Um, so that's not a good sign. Um, and then the last thing is, if you're, say, looking at a, a website evaluating an application, it's always good to go to Google and just do a site colon and then the URL and just see what shows up in the Google results for that site because you don't want... Um, you don't want random stuff of yours ending up in a search engine after using it. And then also we showed a, a demo of how um, people can actually pollute the Google results with porn links and stuff like that. If that site's been hacked, it's a good way to notice is to see, you know, is it on a blacklist? Absolutely. Um, is it on a malware blacklist? And stuff like Google's actually, um, and Bing, of course. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in particular, Bing. Um, that's my favorite. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just for the camera down there. Bing only. Never use Google. There's no um, camera at the back. Oh, no, there's not, is there? Okay. So, um, so from that perspective, that's actually where um, attackers, and if you're doing a pen test, you'll actually go to first. You do a lot of recon through Google and actually find what has been um, found. You will find, um, if you look for in URLs of um, you know, password.mdbs in the old days or um, files that may contain um, private information, there are thousands of what would be restricted files just sitting out there in the Google searches um, available for um, open access. So, um, so what would Educa do? So this, this case study we've got, what sort of things do they do to stop those bad smells? Um, so the first thing they do is to make sure their sites are only accessed over HTTPS. So their app is a daycare management or portfolio management system. So um, staff of the daycare can create portfolios for all the children that, that go there during the day of you know, work that they've done, artwork, pictures of them playing, um, that sort of thing. Um, and while the, um, I guess it's not a high security kind of critical system, the parents whose children are at these daycares are worried about all the sorts of things that parents worry about with the internet and their children, um, which I won't go into. But So um, they've decided that their site's always going to be over HTTPS. So the kinds of attacks that we saw on the previous talk where someone could sniff your cookies won't happen because the site's always encrypted. And there was a question from um, uh, a couple of guys from the last session as well about, um, so what do you do in the fact that, say, uh, sessions that have originated in HTTP are moving to HTTPS if you don't have the, if you're actually using the same <coughs> token as you move between the two? So there's a number of um, common design patterns, um, for instance, to um, abandon sessions that started life in HTTP before you moved to HTTPS, because what will actually happen is that the session token will remain valid. So imagine now Kirk's gone onto the uh, website, his session token was exposable over HTTP first, maybe I sniffed it over the wireless. He's now gone to HTTPS, so I can't see anything else that he's doing, but I've already snuffed his session token, so I can still use session hijacking. He, over HTTPS, is now going to authenticate that session. He's going to log in, he's going to raise the privileges. Um, so it's quite important to understand where your session may have been tampered before you move to HTTPS. 
Um, the second step is to make sure that the cookies are only sent over HTTPS. Um, so when you set cookies, um, you need to put this little secure flag on the end of them. Um, and there's just a standard setting for this in your web config if you're building a .NET site. Um, and while you're at it, make sure they're HTTP only as well, which means that JavaScript can't access the cookies. So if you have any other issues cross-site scripting, your cookies can't be stolen from JavaScript. And then the third thing that they do is to add the strict transport security header. So what this does is um, the browser keeps a little database, um, the user's web browser, of all the sites they've visited that have told them never come back to me over HTTP. So the first time you go to an Educa site, it sends this header saying um, strict transport security only and then a really long expiration date. The browser stores that in the database and it'll never go to HTTP to that site again. It'll only go HTTPS. Um, so what, what that means is the first time you go to an Educa site, maybe you'll type HTTP colon slash slash blah.educa.co.nz and go over HTTP, <coughs> but every single request from then on, your browser will never let you go HTTP. Um, and this header is supported in Chrome and Firefox. Um, I don't think it's in IE yet, um, but you can look at caniuse.com to see um, when these can be used, uh, which browsers they can be used. And basically, it's a free setting, um, so you might as well just set it. Um, and that's just an example. It's kind of rudimentary in Chrome and Firefox to actually debug these things. So there's a little um, net internals page where you can see the ones that have been set <coughs> for sites that you've visited. Uh, another thing they do is um, passwords are not limited in characters and they're only stored as salted hashes and they get that for free by using ASP.NET membership providers. So uh, you shouldn't, probably shouldn't really be rolling your own password storage mechanism um, because out of the box there's a pretty decent one. But if you are, make sure you're doing as good a job as that one does. So just for a, uh, a quick show of hands, so people are, are familiar with um, uh, a hash versus in hashing versus encrypting. Who would be confident about the um, difference between the two? So as a uh, 20-second... 20, 20, 20 ooh. Uh, what's the difference between hashing and encrypting? Oh, man, that's hardcore. Hashing is a managed one-to-one um, version. Encrypting is a one-to-one Cool, good answer. That's you get a crunchy bath. Um, well, so... So his answer was hashing is many to one and encrypting is one to one. So when you encrypt something, you're storing the entire blob of data and you're able to decrypt it and get the original data back. Um, hashing is one way. And hashing is one way, which is a destructive operation. So when I hash a password, I get effectively a number at the end of that hash that, um, that represents the password, but there's no way of going back from the hash back to the original password. And a good way to think is, um, imagine you now encrypt one character, you're going to get a pretty small crypto file. If you encrypt a gig of data, you get a really big crypto file, because you've encrypted it, and you can get it back again. Was that you? No, it was you. No, it wasn't me. Um, and whereas if you hash one character with SHA-1, it'll be a 40-character string. If you hash a gig of data with a SHA-1 hash, it's still going to be a 40-character string. So that's the point, is that it's... Uh, it's one way only. Now the difference between a salted hash, so if I were to do a SHA-1 hash on a Windows machine in New Zealand at midnight of a particular string, and you were to do a SHA-1 hash of a, the same string but at a different time of day in a different place on a different OS, <coughs> would that be a different or the same string? So the SHA-1 algorithm is deterministic, I guess. Whatever exactly. input so, you put into it will always come out with the same hash. So a that's how you check the password afterwards. will always end up with the same hash. Yes. Yep. So that's the point. And that's where hashing is broken. This is why we get rainbow tables. So the point is, if I hash a particular string, the SHA-1 hash of that, or the MD5 hash, will always be the same thing. So this is where we salt hashes. We add some random data to it, so that you can't work out what my password is. And it's just, uh, maybe it's a random number, maybe it's a good, maybe it's my user ID. There's a number of different approaches. But salting the hash is critical, because otherwise, if I, like in LinkedIn, if I store, um, steal six and a half million passwords from LinkedIn, like they did, unsalted SHA-1 hashes, it means that you can break a number of the passwords. Yep. It just cool. makes it a lot easier. So. Okay, the next category of smell we have wrapped up into the two trusting category. And they look so, really smiley. Look at that. So that this is Spider-Man like, swinging past the casino and noticing the, guard, the guards are a little bit too welcoming and they're letting everyone come in. And even though they have a sign saying no rubber thongs after 6 p.m. I know, that's quite which disturbing. Is quite disturbing. I mean, wouldn't a rubber thong be Chase? really uncomfortable? I know, it really would do. <laughs> and, and I tend to wear mine after 6 p.m.? Yeah. It's, it's, I guess, and, but Man. you're allowed to wear leather thongs, so that's good. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so even though they're very welcoming, um, maybe they shouldn't be. 
So this is a kind of sickly sweet smell. Things are a little bit too easy or a little bit too nice. And that probably means that the system's trusting a little bit too much. Um, so this is common, common issues you'll see in lots of systems. This is not treating the, um, treating the input they get as potentially malicious. It's not being nasty enough. Trust no one. Trust nothing. If you want to mix your X-Files with your Spider-Man. Ooh, imagine Fox <coughs> Mulder in a Spider-Man suit. That would be a really cool show. That would be cool. Okay, yeah. um, okay. Uh, so some examples of being too trusting. So if I try and log into the site 10 times <clears throat> with the wrong password, um, and it lets me log in again with, on the 11th time with the correct password, that probably means that it's not going to lock me out if I do 100 random passwords or 1,000. Um, so is there actually a brute force limit to stop me entering the same password in over and over and over again? So this is something that you can easily test on an app. Um, so the reason you want to stop someone from being able to try 1,000 passwords is that you know, there's 1,000 really popular passwords in dictionaries on the internet or a million um, and you don't want people to be able to try all of them on your system. So typically you'll lock, the, lock them out. Um, if there's a change password page, you don't have to enter the existing password on that page. That means that if I walk away from my computer and Andy comes along, he can change my password to anything he wants. Absolutely. So make sure that you're forced to enter your current password before you change it. Um, if you see an app where certain characters give errors or they display funny, then there's a few things that, that could be going on there. So we saw in the previous talk that a single quote in a, in a search query um, led to SQL injection, um, or at least indicated that SQL injection was possible. But similarly, if you, get a, if you enter a, a less than symbol into an app um, and it doesn't display properly on the next screen you go on or there's an error message, that probably means that they're not encoding their output properly. It might be cross-site scriptable. Um, if you enter foreign language characters or Unicode and weird things happen, um, that's probably a bad sign. Absolutely. Semicolons. Um, so what we do is we just ask our testers to try a bunch of these kind of characters and make sure nothing bad happens. Well, I guess the, uh, so out of interest, the first two put together actually reminds me of an uh, interesting attack we saw where uh, custom, it was a custom cross-site scripting attack particularly designed for a, for a site that had anti-brute forcing on the login but didn't have anti-brute forcing on the change password page. And so what the script would do is that when you went to the change password page, it would behind the scenes multiply post to change the password for you, but there was no brute forcing that stopped you getting the password wrong on that page. So it assumed if you're already authenticated, so the idea is I'd leave behind some malicious script, that would be on the page that was running when you went to change the password, and the script would just keep sitting there trying to change the password, and there was no anti-brute forcing. Because it would seem that once you're already in, that's not a place that you'd bother doing it. Cool. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. So um, give the man a bit um, of chocolate. So you can do it because I can't throw it. Oh, okay. Um, so the, the gentleman who's about to be hit on the Ninja. head with chocolate. <laughs> wow. wow. Spidey. Oh, thank you. You're doing surprisingly well. Um, so he said that there's a counter argument to the brute force protection, which is that um, it can lead to denial of service. So say I know that Andy is a user of the system. Yep. I can just go to the system, enter his username and 10 random passwords, and he's locked out. Correct. Um, and that's kind of a trade-off that you have to make, is whether you rather lock people out or let people be, uh, let their accounts be broken into. That's right. So I guess um, this is where, though, um, you'd either start to use a capture, so after, after 10 attempts um, you failed, now you use a capture to prove that there's some human interaction, or just slow it down. So even if, instead of doing a lockout, maybe you do a lockout for 20 seconds. Because if you look at how long it's going to take to brute force a decent strength password, so if it now takes me 20 seconds per 10 requests, so in the previous one, I was saying how um, uh, some of the password or hash breaking now is incredibly fast. That some of the uh, there was a um, one of the researchers on an AMD Radeon chip was able to do 4.4 billion or 4.8 billion MD5 hash hashes at once. Uh, but if you're now doing a brute force attack against a website that stops for 20 seconds <coughs> after each 10, then you haven't locked the account out, but you made the brute force pretty much impossible. So that's the yeah. sort of things. That's the sort of trade-off that you do. But you're quite right. Um, there's a common one where if you can now um, 
do username enumeration, say I go to the registration page and I keep registering different user accounts and if it keeps telling me that that user exists. Forgotten password's a favourite place, I get a forgotten password, put in email addresses, go, nah, nah, you're no good, you're no good. And it goes, yes, you exist. So this is where I've enumerated the thousands of users. And now I now go through and as Kirk said, I'll do 11 password attempts on each one, poof, and just lock everyone out. So it's a very effective DOS. Um, so that is, the, I guess, the design considerations you need to look at. Yeah. Um, Another thing to watch out for is when there's JavaScript that's validating the user input, uh, because you know, like there'll be a text box where you can type something in and it won't let you type certain characters. Um, often what you'll find is that the JavaScript has different rules than the server does for the same text field. Um, so if you bypass the JavaScript and just post data to the server, it might get past those validation <laughs> rules. Check. Um, if a user's typing and as they're typing in a web page, the content's showing up on the screen immediately. So I'm thinking like a text box where you enter your address and then there's like a preview of your business card showing straight away. That's a common uh, reflected XSS attack where um, you know, it's all happening in the browser um, as you type JavaScript and it'll run straight away. Um, if you ever see SQL anywhere, it's a very bad sign. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think a custom SQL on the input that comes from the client is always quite good. Yeah, so yeah. occasionally you'll see a where clause or an order by clause on a URL. Um, that's normally a very bad sign. Very bad sign. Um, if you're looking at, you know, viewing source on an app and you see there's nothing really random in the app at all, then it's probably open to cross-site request forgery. And Andy did an awesome demo of cross-site request forgery um, in our last talk, um, which showed... <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do it again? <laughs> okay. For those who was here at the previous one, yeah. Okay. So the CRF, CSRF that wasn't working. So you know, if you're trying to do a security demo, but what you do is you turn on the defences first. Uh, so for those who know about like the View State Mac, um, as an example, uh, would know that there are ways in .NET that you defend against CSRF. So what I have. So for those people who weren't at the previous one, this is a really simple website. It does some stuff. One of the things I would do here is on this site, I'm logged in as Kirk. That's who I am, Kirk Don Gone Bad. Are you still logged in? Yes, maybe. Slow refresh, just in case I break my demo for a second time, which would be really funny. <laughs> oh, it's time me out. There was going to be. Think... Thank you, Kirk. Oh, oh my. I he think I get to get chocolate for that. never going to let me forget that. <laughs> and you remember that time your demo broke and then it was going to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> So here I am. So, uh, if this look, demo breaks again, Andy's going to bite no. everyone chocolate. Oh, shit. <laughs> no so, pressure. Um, yeah, no pressure. <laughs> so as you can see, but, but it, like, it worked earlier on, like about uh, half and uh, 36 minutes ago. So, um, so what I do is I don't type in any information. All I do, so you can see that Kirk has left two recent comments today, three recent comments. Uh, if Kirk views Andy's web page... And this was far cooler if it had worked first time. So, hopefully, by just purely viewing this HTML page that is on a separate website that has a built-in CSRF attack which posts back to the site that it just came from and posting an action, therefore, using the active session on the site I was on before, then, hopefully, <laughs> what that just did... Shh, I haven't refreshed the page yet. No! Thank you, CSRF. Uh, so all I did, mate, corky beauty crap, rip ones, rip ones of grass. So um, which I apparently was told was a normal Aussie phrase for Good. sweet as bro. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sweet as bro. So again, so uh, so I'm not going to dive into. If anyone's interested in the mechanics behind a CSRF, if you remember. The home page is on a different website. It was an HTML page. Basically, it's got a zero by zero iframe containing a form that creates the data I want the victim to post to the site they've come from, and it basically uses their mm. active session to post my data. So, so if, you're, if you're inspecting an app or you're building an app and there's nothing random going back or nothing that looks kind of random going back in the, re the request to the server when you, <coughs> when you post those comments or do whatever you do on the app, then it probably means an attacker can construct that exact same post and put it on their site Correct. and do cross-site request forgery. And again, so understand the mechanics. So we've seen people before now who say, yes, we're good, we've got CS, CSRF tokens. Uh, but however, what they've done is come up with a GUID and it's the same token across the whole site all the time. Um, you're like, oh, that kind of missed the point. Um, so again, if you're sitting there going, why did that miss the point? Um, then feel free to read more on CSRF. 
CSRF and how that works. We'll come and ask us. Um, and the last example is um, of being too trusting is putting URLs in the query string of your page. So a common kind of place you'll see this, um, as was in Educa, is they had a page um, where you could choose which daycare centre you wanted to go to, and each of these links went to switch daycare centre to question mark, and then the URL of the page that you want to go to. And if you see URLs in URLs, then you can potentially trick visitors into going to different places. So, so what else did they do? Um, so to prevent brute force um, of passwords, they just enabled the standard membership provider behavior, which um, you can configure how many attempts you're allowed to do in, in a certain size window, and it'll lock the accounts out. Um, and then the other thing that you've got to remember is anywhere that accepts a password, you want to do these same checks. So they've got a mobile API that needs to do the same checks. They've got a change password screen where you type your password in, you need to do the same checks. So anywhere the password gets entered. Check um, they have this cool feature where you can choose your own URL. Um, so I've chosen kirksdaycare.educa.co.nz as, as my URL. Um, so there's some words that they probably don't want you to use um, with their brand name on the end. So they probably don't want swearword.educa.co.nz. They probably don't want um, www or mail or FTP or VPN. UAT. Or yeah. any of those kind of words that are normally sort of reserved. So they have to have a list of stuff that's, that's not allowed to be used. Interesting thing about this feature is it kind of lets you find out who all their customers are. So um, like we were saying earlier about how you can potentially find out all the users of a site by going to the reset password screen and typing in different email addresses and seeing which ones it says aren't valid, um, you can also find out which daycares are using this by trying the URL and it's saying whether it's available or not. Um, but you can also just type that URL onto your web browser, so it's, it's not really giving away any more information. Um, as I was saying, they have a feature which redirects you off to different URLs, so Kirk1 and Kirk2 are different websites. Um, so they need to make sure that they don't redirect you off to google.co.nz, um, otherwise it would be a good phishing attack. Um, so make sure you have good validation anytime you're passing URLs around make sure it ends in your, do, your domain name, um, that sort of thing. Um, so on the change password screen, oh, this is just them asking for the existing password. And also a little note, um, if you let people change their email address, so often when you sign up to sites, they want you to prove that you own the email address. So the typical flow is, you know, welcome to our site, would you like to join? Um, you enter your email address and it sends you a welcome message and you follow the link to activate your account. Um, and that means that the site knows that, you know, kirk at um, mysite.com is my email address um, and that I have access to read that email. But you've also got to remember when you change your email address inside the application to do the same check again. So make sure that people can't just change their email address to, you know, Bill Clinton or Bob Smith, Joe, John, Jack. Whatever. Well, so that, that's their name, in which case that'd be fine. Yeah, that'd be yeah. fine. Um, to stop seat conjecture, they use an ORM. So um, ORMs are pretty good. So there's um, Link to SQL, uh, um, Entity Framework, uh, um, and a few other ones around. And the nice things about them is they stop um, you constructing SQL, SQL by hand because it does it for you. You just say, you know, give me all the objects with this, and it returns them. You don't have to create a SQL statement. However, for lots of people who use ORMs, what is the most common place that they tend to handcraft really complex queries of their own? Search strings! Excellent. Somebody who was here with the previous session and actually was awake for the whole thing. Thank you. Good man. Cool. The, so the, the third category of smells... Did you get some chocolate before? No. I oh, have four. Oh. It's now on Dan Owani. There was at least... The fact <coughs> you stayed awake for our last session is worth chocolate. Who's it going towards? No, that dude there. So look, he's getting ready. Oh, dude. Red Bull. Ah, so that, no, not you, him. So that, the dude drinking Red Bull. Ready? Wah! Oh, shit. Sorry, dude. Ah, oh, um. Sorry. At least it wasn't a can of Red Bull. Jeez. That would have been quite devastating. We're giving away surface give pros. <laughs> That's right. Donk! <laughs> um, no comment. Okay. So then Which the next category of... Um, 
issues are the spilling your secrets. So we did originally call this spill your guts, but the images that came up didn't look good. No. So we changed it to spill your secrets. But we kept the smell as vomit. Because it's still. got the smell of vomit, because yeah. otherwise it's like the smell of spilt water. It's like, oh, what, really? So, no. so the casino manager is, is really telling too much stuff to other people. The secrets inside your system are leaking out, um, leaking to the outside world. So some examples, um, if you ever see a password sent by email, or even if you ever see a password at all, that's a really bad sign. Because why should a site ever display a password to you? In fact, it should never be, for non-repudiation, you should never be able to get someone's password out of the database. So anywhere that you're storing either reversible encrypted passwords or plain text, then um, obviously bad. Um, and likewise, if you, when you change your password, it shows your current password. I guess that's kind of an obvious it's extension. It's kind of stupid. We've actually seen this in JavaScript, where um, it was hidden in the form, but the JavaScript actually contained the password. And the JavaScript did the check to see if you just put in the right password. Really? That, that was, was real. Really? I know. And they paid you to it review was, their site. Yeah, I know. What a, what and a they waste of money. Review it again, <laughs> and then again. So you wouldn't be referring to the my ticket site, No. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the, for this event? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So that's a bad smell. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty right but smell. No one here would have used a decent password for their ticket registration. You'd use something disposable. Hopefully you didn't use your online banking password for it. Or if you did, just let me know. Uh, go down the back, dude. Oh, oh, really? Awesome. Okay. It's, it's the dude with no money. <laughs> Ah, so I guess, but hang on. So if this is, um, so you're talking more on the router, like on the proxy coming through as well. Um, so actually, you've got to be quite careful of proxy and cache content. Um, no, he's talking about the router config. Oh, but on the router config. So if you've got a default password, absolutely. But if you've also got, are you saying that then, um, from where the router can see, you've also got cache contents of plain text passwords coming through? Indeed. Yeah. Um, so actually, uh, proxies and those sorts of things you've got to be quite careful of, for exactly that reason, is that you've got, say, uh, credit cards and passwords stored beautifully in the database at the back end, but you've got your HTTPS keys loaded on some kind of proxy or WAF on the way through. And exactly right, it's basically now just storing a big log of all the stuff that came through. So, so other else? bad smells, um, characters that abandon text fields, or we already talked about that. Um, seeing a customer ID in the URL, so say you're using an application and you're customer 32, you've logged in, why does it need to have the customer 32 in the URL? What happens if I change that to 31 or 33? Do I get to see someone else's information? And likewise, anything else in the URL that looks predictable, like, um, you know, if we're looking at that, um, the Hackhead site showing sessions at TechEd, you know, um, should session two, session three, session four, can I tell how many sessions there are by watching the URLs and fiddling with them? Um, we talked about an app called Weedle, which um, launched and then relaunched in New Zealand, um, where, um, where you are able to change the URL and edit other people's auctions just by changing the auction number in the URL. And it's exactly what happened to Citibank back in uh, 2011, where, of course, once you logged in, then um, uh, some bright spot noticed that their credit card number was part of the URL um, credentials to have a look at the statement balances. I'm like, well, what happens if I change that to someone else's credit card? Um, and so that was quite a um, public breach where you could basically, as long as, as long as you had one account, then you could just surf anything of anyone else's account. The good news is, though, that Citibank got some free publicity in the New York Times. Exactly. That's always so, good. There's no yeah. such thing as bad press. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, so, so now people know that they supply credit cards. Yes. Ah, oh, very handy. There <laughs> yeah. you go. Wow. This is why Kirk doesn't run the marketing division of Xero. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the, then the last bad smell is if you can tell how they're actually storing data, so, or, or the underlying technology. So if you, if you can kind of tell that they're using LDAP because you see, you know, OU equals blah somewhere in the URL, or you can tell they're using SQL because you see an order by, um, or you can tell they're using X, 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 that thing, because they've got an X path expression, then that means you have a lot more information to know how to attack them. So I've done attacks where um, I was able to use LDAP injection to search across the entire LDAP database and pull the data out just because I could see 
that it was using LDAP on one query. Absolutely. And I guess this is where the uh, demo before about the regex issues. So this is a common one where, again, the regex expressions that are used for validation are pumped to the client, which gives the attacker the perfect opportunity to have a look at the regex for logic bombs or things that might occur there. So, But it's a hard one because your system should be, though, so secure that you can uh, list all of the information about your systems um, openly online. You should say, this is how it's built, this is the encryption algorithms I'm using, uh, and there should be no security through obscurity. In other words, it should be fine if I know all about your app, uh, but we find a lot of the time that that's not the case. Um, so, Okay, so, so things that um, this case study do, so rather than emailing you your password when you sign up, they email you a one-time link. Um, so it's got some randomness on the end. You can only use that once. Um, so that means that all their users in their inbox, their password isn't just sitting there waiting for someone to discover it. Um, oh, that was the only example. Um, so the next smell we've grouped into category of the back door being open. So you've gone to the front of the casino and it's looking pretty awesome, but you walk around the back and it smells like garbage and you can see the doors swinging open. There's a, a plastic bag full of receipts in the recycling. Um, so, you know, the front of the system is good, but there's other ways to get in. Absolutely. Um, so some examples, um, sensitive information that's not encrypted, um, admin sites being available to the world. So, um, you know, I'm a big fan of not having God mode in your applications, that you actually have to access a different application that's restricted from the internet. Um, there was, I think it was Twitter that had this issue where every Twitter employee, when they logged into Twitter, had super user mode where they could do stuff. Um, and it only took one of their employees to get their password hacked um, and someone could cause carnage. Um, authorization, so often sites will change the menu depending on your role. Um, so if you see that happening, it's kind of a bad smell because you want to check, are they actually checking on the pages that the menu links to that the person has the right role? Because if you're developing it properly, you have to do the check when you're displaying the menu, you have to do the check when someone does the get of the page to do the check on all the postbacks to that page, and often people forget some of them. Um, and then another bad smell is production data being in test environments, and this is one that really annoys me, because uh, I'll sit on a WebEx or a call with someone, and they'll go, we're just going to demo our super secure HR fancy system to you, and um, they log in, and it's like, there's a list of 40 customers on the screen, and then they click on one of them, and it's got real employee names on it. And that's a really bad sign because that means they're not treating customers' data with the appropriate level of reverence, I guess. Or I guess probably uh, relevant to lots of people in the room here is that we time and time again will find the production database. Um, there was some issue perhaps with the search running slow. So I restored a copy of Prod onto our UAT server to test, test the search queries. But the UAT box is just sitting with its bum on the internet and it's got um, no proper authentication, it's got you know weak passwords, or then the dev actually took a copy and put, stuck it on the laptop. And so we now end up with like 200 copies of Prod data floating randomly around the place, laptop as opposed to the in. one sort of yeah. place it should be in. So, uh, and I guess I would almost challenge anyone that says that doesn't go on in their organisation. Um, we see it just about everywhere except for zero. Oh, we don't do that. So we've got really strict rules that production data never leaves that environment and it pisses people off all the time, but it's Absolutely. just tough. <laughs> They can just fabricate test data. Now you see, this is where they Kirk has absolutely it. moved from the world of being a developer to security officer. Because um, now he's really happy to piss people off. <laughs> um, so some things that Educa did, um, so they don't have a God mode in their app, they have a separate admin application that's um, not accessible, um, and then just making sure they do the role checks everywhere. Um, and as a tester, that's the kind of thing you'll test as well. So um, you'll log in as a user and you'll kind of build up a map of the site, um, and tools like Burp that we've showed in the previous session will help you do that. And then you'll try and do all those same actions with a lesser privileged role and see what happens. Yes, it reminds me of a uh, very interesting um, uh, destructive process we had during a web crawl one day. So the um, doing a big... Uh, Pen test of a site that um, accidentally <coughs> kind of forgotten to put any real authorization on the site. So good authentication, you could only get in with a valid user account. But what it actually had is um, some of the URLs, everything was just done in a um, GET request. And so uh, if you looked at the list of users, then after the list of users, there would be a button that might be delete, which was literally a URL that would say, you know, users slash 
um, ID equals action equals, say, delete. And so what we actually found is by crawling this site, the <laughs> crawler went through and said, oh, I found a bunch of delete links, followed them, and every single link it followed was poof, poof, poof. So we've been sitting there just running a crawl poof, across the whole site and as an admin. We're like, well, that's cool. So we're just running a crawl on the site. Somebody goes, UAT's down. Like, oh, jeez. You know, bloody test environment's down again. People go, what? The database is just disappearing. I'm like, oh, jeez, that sounds crazy. <laughs> and the scans are running. Are you doing it? Nah. <laughs> they're sitting there. And then they go, but, but look at it. We've just had 10,000 requests. And, and you're like, you have? Oh, oh crap, really? Um, and, and, so it, and this, ladies and gentlemen, what, is why it's important to have professional liability and indemnity insurance. Absolutely. If you're a security tester. And that's why it's very important that you go, look, I'm not quite sure how your system's going to respond to a decent security test. It may be completely destroyed, is pretty much wording that we now have in the contracts. Um, so you, you can tread carefully, but to go, seriously, a crawl really deleted your whole database so, is just... So that's actually something we should have put on here. If you see um, URLs, so gets... Um, that perform actions on the server that modifies the state of the server, then that's a bad sign. Because anything that changes the state of a server should be a post, or if you're a happy, you know, put or delete. Um, because gets happen all the time in the web browser, and it's really easy for someone to put, you know, like a, a website on the internet with an image tag that says, um, you know, HTTPs colon slash slash Andy's super secret slash slash user slash ID equals one slash delete. Um, and then if someone visits that site and it tries, their browser tries to open the image and they're logged into Andy's super secret site, it'll Oof. delete the user. Game on. So you've always got to have posts or puts or deletes or whatever, hippies. Um, so the next category of issues are the DIYs. And um, I don't actually know what this guy's doing. but No, we were trying to work out. First of all, we went, oh, look, he's kind of making his own bullet. But it's not. He's kind of like drilling it's, a hole. I think Anyone have one of these handle. at home? Any crazy Aussie DIYs? A, is it a plane? Well, no, it's a plane, but look, it's actually like drilling down. Why is it? Ooh. So you reckon he's just taken out a door handle? Dude. So he's not a terrorist assembling bullets. I'll tell you what. That's right. These, these Aussies are right. They're just at a different plane. Us, us Kiwis being... No. That's just right. We're all like, shit, really? You have handles on those things? <laughs> shit, there we go. Yeah. Uh, so, <sighs> yeah, good on you. So Thanks. the DIY, the oily rag smell, someone's done something themselves that they shouldn't have done. This doesn't smell professional. Um, so there's a lot of really smart people that build security software um, or security libraries for you to use in your software. And they work at places like Microsoft, and they do a really good job. Um, and we're not good at doing that stuff ourselves. So if you ever see someone building something in their cell, and that's their self, that's a bad sign. Um, so some examples, you know an ASP.NET site that doesn't use forms authentication? That's kind of a bad sign because forms authentication generates random, non-predictable cookies, very hard to tamper. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff built in for you there, and you're generating your own cookies in a different format to show who's logged in. Chances are there's a username and password in that cookie or something equally bad. Um, people that have built their own single sign-in system, so you know, logging into foo.com also gets you logged into um, you know, www.foo.com and mail.foo.com. Um, that's normally a bad sign because those things are actually quite hard to get right. Home-built crypto, that's quite an interesting one. We had a client who um, they had to post... Uh, private information between apps. There was no way to pass it. So again, having things like user IDs, passwords, perhaps on the query string is what they decided they needed. So they used AES-256 to encrypt it. Okay, so that's cool. So now what it would have is that, that if I was going to go to another system, the, uh, the query string and the whole um, URL would be um, where the param equals and they had this big crypto string. And you go, well, that's not bad. I can't break AES-256 in a hurry. So it's pretty secure. Until we realised that they used the same static key that was built into the web app full stop. So what it meant is that everything was always encrypted in the same way with the same key. So you go, is that an issue? So imagine now a request that an admin might put in that would perform an action elsewhere. And imagine now I've managed to get a copy of that URL. Maybe it's sitting in the history of the browser. Maybe I've sniffed it on the way through. So this is where the site was completely open to a replay attack. So I didn't know what the URL did, but if I grabbed it and ran it, game on. I was just passing a whole bunch of crypto data. 
Um, so again, so these are the sort of things that, um, that, that happen if you kind of grow your own crypto. Yeah, and I've seen that with custom single sign-on things. You know, like you go from one site to another and it passes you across a URL that gets you into it. And that's, that URL just works forever if you ever copy it. Yeah, um, if you're interested in um, doing some homework, um, there was a category of attacks. There were um, the ASP.NET padding oracle attacks from a few years ago, probably three or four years ago. Yep. Um, and the issue there was it was using the same encryption, ASP.NET was using the same encryption key for lots of different things. Um, and so by, now, by, by being able to um, fiddle around with requests for JavaScript, which used the AXD handler with a bit of um, crypt, uh, encrypted blob on the end, yep. they were actually able to figure out what the key was and then create their own forms of cookies because it was using the same encryption key. So you, you don't want to build it yourself and you don't want to share the crypt, encryption key. And while we're at it, of course, if you ever see um, a site with an encryption key checked into source code, um, that's not a good sign because it probably means that's the same one in production. Um, so the last... The last example of DIY. Oh, my bad. Stop playing with it. I'm sorry, it's a little twiddly thing. Play with your own little twiddly thing. Don't touch mine. Um, <laughs> cookie flags. Um, so if you see people um, that have got cookies that have expiration dates, but they're in a long way in the future, that means the browser's going to store them on disk. Um, or they don't have expiration, that means it's a session cookie. They'll last as long as the browser is open. But what happens if they're using one of these new browsers that keeps your cookies. Um, so, is it Chrome, I think? You shut Chrome and you start it back up and all your cookies are still kept there from the last time you used it. Um, so, you actually have to put something else inside your cookies to expire them. You can't rely on the browser to do that anymore. And of course, if you've signed in with Chrome, then it's got everything, including all your auth cookies in there as well. So, it's pretty hardcore. Yeah. Um, I love that. The cookie domain, so cookies that work for um, .domain.com. So, if I... What's the site? Microsoft.com. If I'm um, logging into login.microsoft.com and it sets a cookie with the .microsoft.com domain, <coughs> that means any site I visit in my browser that ends in Microsoft.com will get that cookie, um, which means that you've dropped your security to the, the weakest link, basically, whichever of those, any of your sites at Microsoft.com. Really shouldn't have used them as an example. <laughs> Google.com. Google Google.com. Google yeah. Hey, yeah. So, <laughs> You really want to restrict your cookies so they only go to HTTPS sites. They only go to the smallest number of pages possible. So things that Edgica did, um, so they used all the standard built-in stuff. So um, timeout settings and login, um, abandoning sessions on login. So we've talked about that already, making sure that when you log in, you throw away that session object and start from scratch. Because um, often, even though in ASP.NET people don't, or don't often use session for the actual authentication, often you'll stash other stuff in session. Um, so I've seen people stash the roles collection. So they log in with the forms auth cookie, but they stash all the users' roles in, in session. Or they'll stash you know, some work in progress, um, you know, part three of the wizard, which has already collected your first name, last name, and credit card number. Um, and so that means that if someone was able to grab your session before you logged in, they might be able to keep refreshing the page and see what you've later on added to it. So one of the questions that I had at the end of the last one was about um, during a security review, someone was told that they should be mapping their um, ASP.NET auth cookie against the session token. Um, and they were kind of going, well, why is that bad? What's wrong if I've got an auth cookie, but then my session token changes? Uh, and again, for exactly that reason, that again, imagine now I've self-registered on the site, so I've gone in as a low-level user with no access, but I've got a valid auth cookie. Maybe I've now done some session hijacking and managed to steal some session IDs of admins or other valid users, so I use my auth token to get in, but if the roles and privileges are stored in the session token, um, then that's where there's an issue. So if you've got one valid auth, user auth re-rolling with different session IDs, um, then that's the security sort of, the breach or the risk there is that I'm trying to escalate my privileges. Um, so that's the, I guess, where often the authentication and the authorization are not managed properly. Lots of crowds get really solid authentication, how I get in, but it's the authorization of what I can do when I'm in there that often breaks. Cool, the next category of smells are the, are the dodgy, dodgy foundation. foundation. So, and what would a dodgy foundation smell like? Are you sure? Yeah. Yes. So the, the casino looks awesome. The vault is super strong, but it's built on top of quicksand. 
You know, there's the stuff that your application's built on is poorly architected or old technology or vulnerable technology. So some examples of this, please don't take offense if your apps are built this way, um, is when you see like lots of different apps that talk to each other. So you know, you've got this ecosystem of web applications that are sharing data, some of them made by third parties, some of them not. That's not normally a good sign. Oh, look, I guess my CSRF example, so where we've actually seen quite a lot of this is, say, a very solid application that happens to have a third-party help app, as an example. Now, the third-party help app wasn't as secure, it wasn't written by the core company. Um, it was third-party, plugged in. It's got the security weaknesses, but what happens is that within my browser, I'm hopping between my normal live usage and then hopping up some of the help pages. And so this is where, for instance, a compromised help app it was indeed uh, breaking and stealing information from the core app. So these are the yeah. sort of things that we find quite common. And the, the, other, the other one that I've seen heaps of times is that you know, you're building an application that has kind of CMS functionality with one of those rich HTML editors. Yep. And so someone's just grabbed the third party HTML editor, which also allows file upload and yep. spell checking and all these <coughs> other kind of things. Absolutely. Um, if you see an app that's built on multiple technologies, it's normally a bad sign. Like You don't see many ASP um, sites around now, but back in the day when people were converting, you'd see sites that were half ASP and half ASP.net, and often they'd do some nasty hack to make authentication work between the two sites. Um, I've seen other ones that are Java and Perl or PHP and ASP.net. It's just a bad sign because it probably means that they've had to build the, the authentication themselves and build some back-channel communication between the two layers. Um, JavaScript and CSS. So, um, JavaScript and CSS runs in the browser and can uh, do cross-site scripting. If you're loading it from other domain names, so say you're loading some JavaScript from typekit.com or Google Analytics or I can't think of one of Microsoft's that people use, Bing Analytics, um, <laughs> do you trust all those companies to never ever send you malicious JavaScript that will run in your user's browser? Um, so you should think about that. Um, do you trust all these random things that your marketing department wants you to put on the, on the marketing site so they can do evil stuff like track people's mouse positions and draw heat maps. Um, another thing to watch out for is when there's a rich client component. So any time that you've got like a Flash app that's talking back to the server or maybe a rich JavaScript app that's talking back to the server, there's going to be endpoints that you can't see in the browser but that the browser's talking to. And often people will forget about those and they're doing role checks or, um, or anything, things like that. Oh, I guess one of the worst... Um, like a, wrong? I'm getting sleepy. Yeah, dude. I know that um, uh, time lag as well leads to jet lag. Um, so with the um, like rich client apps, one of the worst ones we've seen, uh, so obviously not relevant for you fellas and girls, uh, but the richest Flash app we saw is why I guess Flash is perhaps... People, Not quite so groovy. People use Flash in Australia. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So, so it's still it. relevant. It's still relevant. Yeah. Okay. Um, where basically the uh, authentication was good, but behind the Flash app using Flex, it had about 200 web service calls, and it was the Flash app that decided what it was allowed to call. So, for instance, every request to update data, the Flash app said, should I be updating this data? If I shouldn't, I won't make the web service call. The 200 web services at the back end um, absolutely did no authorization of what you should do. Was it your data? Was it your role to do? Everything was contained in client-side <coughs> validation, which in Webland is absolutely never trust the client. Don't trust data from the client, don't just anything from the client in any way whatsoever. It can all be tampered with. Cool. Um, if, you, if you see they're using old versions of stuff, so it's not a good sign if someone's running Windows 2000 as their web server these days. But um, old ASP.NET versions, also not that great, a, great sign. Actually, even apps that are built using web forms, I'd say is not a good sign, just based on my experience reviewing apps, is that a lot of the web form maps are 10 years old, um, because that's when web forms came out. Um, so you just need to give them a little bit more of a look over. And also, because web forms is 10 years old, you have to work a little bit harder to make it secure. So some of the things that NBC makes easy are a little bit harder on web forms, like encoding your output. Um, and if the app's writing directly to disk, so, um, like uh, Educa, that lets teachers upload pictures about the students. They get stored on the web server on the disk. Um, it's really hard to do file uploads safely. It's really hard to parse files safely. Um, and there's lots of considerations you have to think about, such as not filling up the web server's hard drive, not spinning up 100% CPU when you're parsing things, that sort of thing. 
Um, so these guys, um, so this is just a little map of all the third party um, URLs that their site accessed when I was browsing it. Um, so you can use a tool like this um, that just that burp that we were using before that, that proxies all your requests to see all the things that your site's talking to. So this is talking to intercom.io, it's talking to Typekit, GetClicky, Google Analytics. You have to trust all of those different providers not to send malicious JavaScript. Um, here's my son, isn't he cute? Um, oh, dude, oh. is it your car? No. Oh. <laughs> it's nicer than your car. It also doesn't have a busted engine like my car does. Yeah. Um, so this is an example of files being stored, so you can upload pictures. So um, where do you store them? How do you validate them? So the files that are uploaded, are they actually images or are they bomb recipes? Um, you know, what mime type are you going to send back on them? And um, we did a talk a couple of years ago where we wrote up a lot of different things that we see people forgetting about when they're dealing with file uploads. Um, so um, go have a look on our website, hackhead.com. If you want some tips, it's actually really crazy. Like, if you can just push back and say it's too hard, um, don't let us upload files, it's way easier. <laughs> no, you see, that was definitely the security officer versus yeah. the, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, too hard, don't do it. Cool. So the last category of smells are the risky business smells. So things that make you scared when you see them. There's a lot of apps where someone will say, wouldn't it be cool if we just dot, dot, dot? Exactly. And sometimes those things are dangerous. So in particular, one that you should avoid. Hey, is it time for the session to end or are we... Um... Oh, no, 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 people are ready for the... Uh, no, we need to finish like five early for the lunch rush. Yeah, okay. Yeah, oh, we'll, no, exactly. we'll make sure we don't it's go strategic. late. Strategic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no... It's like, keep it nice and realistic here. Yeah, yeah. no. Cool. Uh, so we've, bellies, mate. we've got more than 10 minutes, but we'll you finish know. soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so credit cards. Like, if you can avoid credit card numbers, then make your life simpler and not deal with credit card numbers. Because as soon as your app has a text field in it that takes a credit card number, you're buying into a whole lot of compliance and security PCI. measures that you don't want to do. It's a four-letter um, word. As I was saying, parsing and file uploads, they're high risk. Um, mobile apps, I'd say that's a risky thing just because... We see a lot of people building mobile apps that talk to web servers without thinking about the stuff that regular web apps think about. Who can access this URL, who can post data to it, et cetera. Absolutely. So, um, so they were our bad smells. So be interested in your feedback. Um, comment on the website or drop us an email. Um, we've got the sheet, so we're not quite finished yet. Um, just relax. Um, we've got the sheet. Um, <laughs> that you can take home with you. So on that um, right-hand column there, that's the reference to the OWASP site. So typically when we do these talks, we talk about security issues, um, and they go from one to 10, the top 10 issues. But instead, this time we've flipped it around to talk about the smells and then try and link it back to the issues you should research. Um, so to so take that home, it's got some information about the case study on the back and stuff on the front. And um, I don't know what else you could do with it. You could fold it up and use it as a pillow or something. You could. You could make a telescope out of it. A uh, megaphone? Yep. Yes. Cool. So, so please do that. Um, speaking of OWASP, they've updated the top 10 issues this year. So you can't see this. We, we know that. So don't try and strain your eyes. Um, each, every three years, they compile a list of the top 10 prevalent issues in web application security. Um, and this year, there was a bit of a jiggle around. The top issues are things like injection, SQL injection, um, broken authentication, cross-site scripting. And everyone that's developing web apps should know this stuff inside out. Like if you're failing on the top 10 issues, then probably you're not going to do too well on the next 30,000 issues. Absolutely so. Um, <laughs> so. It's a good call. So it's a good one to go over with your teams back at the office and just make sure that you understand what these common issues are. Um, what was the new thing? I can't remember. You can go and have a look um, on the OWASP site, which is OWASP.org. Um, and we've also got these publications and some other ones on Andy's website, so he gets the credit for that, um, even though I did half the work. And, That's fine, mate. Um, That's all good. We've got our talks listed up at hackhead.com. But if 
feels like we haven't had a chance to talk. No, I, I don't think we have talked much. Um, actually, you know, something, so I was covering off some numbers um, before. Um, there's another number that, that came to mind. Uh, 4729, 4729. That was the uh, scoreline of the uh, All Blacks Wallabies game. Uh, a couple of, uh, that, oh, what's that other number? 2029. 20, what? <laughs> Come here and I'll tell you about six. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's wrong with the number six, mate? <laughs> what? Jeez, they're um, bloody bug. Uh, well, any... No, the other number that came to mind was the uh, oh the game following that complete slaughtering of the Wallabies. The um, oh, 29 16. What? Oh yeah, okay, yeah, good point. Well, look, if you've got any serious questions, um, then oh what? Richie McCaw is cheating on who? Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Okay, that's it's just dissolving into um. So, like, so, so we want to get you guys early we, in the lunch queue. We kind of started it. I know. We do you. have some uh, Q and A time if you want to go and win a sculpted mouse and do some stuff. That's beautiful. Um, but if you want to come and have a chat to us, it's been a pleasure to Thank be you. over here. Thank you.